Good afternoon. My name is Dennis L. Warner Sr. Today is the 13th of June, 2020. I'm still impacted thinking about the aspect of how do we move from where we are, whether that's as an individual or as a family or as a community or as a world. One of those individuals that believes in the writings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others who adhere to, who believe in a spiritual solution to problems and challenges that occur in this physical world. To that end, that there is a place for what he would call nonviolence. No matter what is said in regard to the particular aspects of the life of a person like Mahatma Gandhi or others, there's something about the way that he was able to sit with probably something like a million people in those settings and by a collective use of mental and spiritual power to bring about an end result for his people, the release from a colonial state to a state of rulership of a country. There's something about the aspect of places like Singapore and others who made it possible for them to move from being, so to speak, a what is called a third world country to becoming an industrialized or first world country. And it's my desire to see the same thing happen for a body of people where they move from being individuals who are in a certain kind of way not respected globally to being respected globally. I believe that those things happen on the level of what is called the fourth dimension first before they happen on the level of the third dimension. The fourth dimension has to do with the imagination. In my estimation, this is not a level where I am seeking to just simply go through the process and talk about the many different levels or dimensions or any of that kind of stuff. That's for another set of scientists to do. That's not my particular point as to how many dimensions there may be and all of this kind of thing. That's, that's, that's not this discussion. That's a discussion you can have with someone else. This may be the first level for some individuals, and I agree that there are other skills, other abilities, all kinds of things that a person can aspire to and achieve. I agree with that. But right now, I'm speaking of what I call the use of the imagination. And one of my reference points is the idea of using the imagination, the ability of the human to create images in his or her mind. I reference also the individual who was called a mystic. His name is Neville Goddard. There are copious writings by Neville of his sermons and his presentations, uh, all kinds of things, radio broadcasts, a number of things that he has done, books that can be referenced. And so the discussion can be had in regard to him and his particular way of looking at the world. So that's a reference point that you can have as well. Uh, in addition to that, Neville often spoke of uh, his use of the Bible. Notice that I said his use of the Bible. He saw the Bible and the writers of the Bible and the individuals written about in the Bible as tools. In other words, he sought to apply what was written there within the Bible in his own life. He saw those as tools, the end result of 
the use of the Bible, was that it would bring about change in this life, change in this life. The Bible was not to be something by which an individual simply prepared for what some people call the rapture or the second coming or some inevitable in the future heaven that a person was to actually arrive at. That was not what Neville was focused on. His focus, very much like mine, has to do with living in this present life, this present life, to bring about something in this present life. In other words, there were goals that he sought and he taught individuals to seek, to reach, to achieve. And so there was a specific application that he was teaching people to achieve based on the fact that they wanted to achieve specific things in life. And so that's a vital piece. One of the reasons I like that is that it makes it possible to measure an individual's progress in regard to this. It gives some concrete steps that an individual can see, am I progressing? Am I moving forward? When you have goals that you can look at and say, is something working? So that's a vital piece. And one of the reasons that this is vital is that I'm also trained by virtue of going to school and also by virtue of being involved in various programs, trained as in school in what is called industrial organizational psychology. I've done all but the dissertation in regard to a PhD program that I've done, and then also training in regard to a coaching program, an executive coaching program in regard to that as well. And coaches who are not therapists uh, in the sense that we're not trying to fix anybody, nobody gets broken, uh, we're helping individuals to arrive at a point to actually achieve a set of goals. And the individuals that we work with have a clear statement about what their goals are and they are responsible for achieving those goals. So when it comes to coaching, we're not concerned about the aspect of whether or not a person is what one would call a so-called sinner, that that it does not enter into the equation at all. Uh, What comes about is, do you want to achieve a goal? And then each coach has a particular process, a particular set of steps that he or she seeks to help the individual to uh, use in order to achieve those goals. And one of the seemingly universal skills that a coach will teach a client to use is that of visualization. As a matter of fact, there was an individual that uh, a few years ago, I think in 1979, perhaps, or maybe it was 1989, uh, the individual that did a book that became just a phenomenon was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was done by an individual named Stephen Covey. And in that book, it talked about visualization. It talked about the aspect of an architect when he is designing or when she is designing a building that that individual arrives at the point where they see the building as already complete. And he called that beginning with the end in mind. This is pretty much what we're talking about, pretty much what I'm talking about as well. Beginning with the end in mind, beginning with the end in mind. You see it as already completed. You see it as already completed. You get to the end. And for me, Uh, Because I have also been trained and have practiced as a minister, it is very much in line with what the biblical statement says, which is basically believe, it says believe, and that then you receive it. You believe you've already got it, and then as a result of that, you receive it. And one of the early books that I read in regard to this was a book called The ABCs of Prayer, which says, ask, believe, and claim it. And claiming it meant that you return thanks that you've already got it. So you ask, that's the A, and then you believe it, which is the B. And then the C is that you claim it, which means that you return thanks that you already have it. So before you even physically have it, you have received it already by virtue of believing that it's already yours. And as a result of that, because you already have it, it is bound to materialize. And there are a number of examples that are in the biblical statement that speak about this. So very much so, it is a statement that is found in the biblical record as well. 
There are examples, aren't they, examples that are in the biblical statement. That's why I mentioned as to Neville and his particular approach to this is just filled with, his sermons are just filled with examples that come straight out of the Bible, just straight out of the Bible. And he uses this, again, the biblical record is a tool to facilitate a person's believing now believing now, believing what God. So it's not just entertainment, it's empowerment. It's not just looking at it and being able to jump and to dance or whatever it may be that a person may do. It is bringing about a change of life. And that means a change in one's living in this present day and time. And I'm very much in line and in harmony with that idea. And so this particular segment, we're calling Imagination, And does imagination really create one's reality? Does imagination really create one's reality? Now, we can begin that. You can begin that on an individual uh, level, on an individual level. Um, and, And that's one way to look at that. But it can also be on a collective level in regard to a family that believes together for something better. It could be on a community level or group level, and the Bible speaks of that, both of those particular things, a family and then also the aspect of a larger body, where it talks about the aspect of two or three of you shall believe or shall the touch as agreeing, and that's what I'm talking about here. And then a larger body would be, say, more than three. And you are able to come together and believe something together to agree to pursue a particular goal. And you are agreeing as to the methods or the tools or the techniques or the steps that you're going to take in order to move forward. And you stay focused on that particular goal. You may have your own individual private reasons for what you're doing or your private goals, but when the group comes together, when it's formed, then you sense indeed that the Spirit of God is in the midst of you, which is like another mindset, an individual mindset. There's the overall individual mindset of a person, but there's the collective mindset of the body, which is the Spirit of God within the entire collective, so to speak. And when that comes together, the focus is on the body. The focus is on the body. It's like a group of individuals who are playing as a team. They work together with each part, performance, his or her uh, individual part, uh, their function, their, their, their role, if you will, so that the team plays together as a unit or they all play together as one play, uh, if you will, in regard to that. So that's what we're talking about in regard to that. And they're able to vision together to see the entire play as it's worked out. And they may practice together for a period of time so that they see it, they see it before they actually bring it out to the stage so that everybody else is able to see it. So are you with me in regard to that? That's what we're talking about. Just meditate on that for a moment. Let me give you this item called the Day of Inspiration, and we'll come back and we'll talk about this for a little bit.
This particular music is called Day of Inspiration, and I do pray that this is a day of inspiration for you. I'm looking at three articles or three presentations that were done by Neville. One is entitled The Secret of Prayer. The other one is entitled Imagining Creates. And the third one is entitled Imagination Creates Reality. Remember that I've said that we're looking at does imagination create reality? And how does imagination create reality? And this is the presence that we're talking about, the presentation that we're talking about, basically comes out of these particular items. Neville does a great deal of writing and talking and presenting based on the use of imagination and being aware being aware of that which you are involved with, that which you are seeing, that which you know, just a great deal. And in these particular presentations, in particular, the one that I will begin with is the one that says the secret of prayer. And his presentation on the secret of prayer talks about initially of what's the secret of prayer? What are the secrets of prayer? I've already mentioned A, B, C's of prayer. And so anybody that knows the initial three letters of an alphabet, such as the English alphabet, the A, B, C's of prayer, that an individual can look at that and take the first three steps. You know the first three letters of the alphabet. S, A, B is the second one, and then C is claim. And you understand that the letters are actually symbols that are used for a word. So the A, symbol for ass, B, symbol for believe, and then C, claim. But the key is that one actually goes through the process of the asking, that's an action that a person takes. And then the person goes through the process of believing. Again, that's an action that a person takes. And then the person goes through the aspect that you go through the aspect of claiming it. That's another action that a person takes. And so a person may go through all of that and they arrive at the point and say, well, that didn't work. And a person can decide, well, what never taught or what the Bible says, actually, that didn't work. And there are many people that do that. They say the Bible doesn't work or is not true or whatever it may be. Or you can go through the process and says, okay, they gave me the first set of things that I need to do. I did those and they did not bring me the result that I want. Maybe if I tweak that in some kind of way or do it better, or do it differently or whatever it may be. Because really, I don't want to know what didn't work. What I want to know is what does work. It is said that Thomas Edison, one of the greatest inventors the world has ever known, discovered over and over again what did not work. What did not work. It is said that he would do some experiments a thousand times. And each time he would know what did not work. And he kept on going until he discovered what did work. That's one of the secrets of prayer. Is that you want to persist and persist and persist. Keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it until you find what works. Remember, it's your commitment to your goal. It's your commitment to your goal. And whatever it is you're doing because you're breathing every day, because you're living every day, you are doing something. And to the degree that you're committed to your goal, you're doing something every day, every moment of the day. 
and you're either proving that you can bring about your end result or not. You are either proving that your life works and that you are able to bring about your end result or not. Then the one empowers you. I mentioned Stephen Covey. He talks about this aspect of beginning with the end in mind. Another thing he says is work within your circle of influence. So you set a goal that you have the most likely, most likely chance of achieving. Work within your circle of influence. Think about the least thing that you could do that might bring you success. It's barely outside your rim of the things that you're doing now. It's the most likely thing. You're not doing it, but it's the most likely thing that you would achieve success in doing. You're not doing it right now, but it's so close to what you're doing right now, just a little stretch beyond, and you say, I want to go for that goal. You've never achieved something like that before, but you want to stretch just beyond where you are. And then you pray for that to be done. Ask, believe, claim for that to take place in your life. That's what you call the building of faith. And you persist. It may not come that next moment or that next day or that next week. But what you want to do is to understand the principles of prayer. Do they work? Or if you want to say, does God hear me? Does God answer that's the secret of prayer. Persistence is one of the secrets of prayer. Working it until it works. Working it until it works. Working it until it works. This is, again, an item that is in this place where Neville was talking about the secret of prayer. Persistence. Persistence is a secret of prayer. Then, Another thing that he says in this particular item is he talks about orientation. Orientation. And when he mentions the aspect of orientation, what he mentions there is he uses an illustration from the Bible. And he talks about Jacob going to Shechem and that he oriented himself towards Shechem. In other words, he determined that he was going to Shechem. He's headed to Shechem. He's got his mind focused on going to Shechem, S-H-E-C-H-E-M. And then he comes and he talks about Daniel in the book of Daniel and how Daniel, this is years later, this is years later, that when Daniel prayed, he oriented himself toward Jerusalem. And then he talks about how the Muslim individuals and Muslims to this day do the same thing. He mentions Mohammedan is the way that he puts it. The people of the Mohammedan world, or we would say the Muslim world, or Islam, they orient, orient themselves toward Mecca. And so he talks about the orientation of individuals in regard to that. But he mentions there that people of a Christian faith, their kingdom is within. The kingdom is within the individual. And so when it comes to this, it talks about that since the kingdom is within, it means being focused within one's imagination, being clear within one's imagination. So you're orienting yourself, I'm orienting myself toward my fulfilled desire. Again, a person like Stephen Cuffey would say, begin with the end in mind. Know it's already, already realize. There's a statement that a person said, said, God stepped out of my today into my tomorrow. So when I got to my tomorrow, he would already be there. Remember that God is omnipresent. God is not going to tomorrow. He's already there. He's not left in the past. He never left yesterday. And he's still in today and he's still in tomorrow. He's omnipresent. This is what Einstein did when he talked about the theory of relativity. E equals mc squared. 
And that is energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And when you talk about the speed of light, you're talking about time. And so time itself, according to the theory, is relative. Relative. Each one of those, when you come to an algebraic equation, each one of those can be equal. You put the other two together in a particular relationship, each one can be equal to the other two based on what the equation may be. And time can be relative. Time can be relative. And so God is seen as he that was, he that is, and he that is to be. Spirit, if you prefer, or you can say force, the almighty, whatever name you want to call, because the statement is that here, O Israel, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. The Lord is one. And so this whole aspect. And so the orientation is to be clear on what you want, so that when you have it, you'll know that your prayer has been answered. Be clear. This whole aspect of this aspect of knowing how to pray. You need to know when your prayer is answered that your prayer has been answered. You need to know that. So persistence, ask, believe, claim, and then also making sure that you're clear on what you ask for so that when the prayer is answered, then you will know that the answer has come. And then the other thing, the last one we'll do for this day, has to do with uh, having it in your mind and allowing, as you are clear on what you want, that there will become within you this psychological adjustment, this, this adjusting that will take place. It's like uh, from the inside of you, there will be a reorientation that takes place that aligns you, aligns me, with that which we are about to receive. And so whatever changes are necessary that are within us, that need to take place within us, those changes will automatically begin to happen. And what we are to do as a result of that, we are to resist not... We are to, the Bible would say, allow God to have God's way within us. And that may cause for a change in mind, a change in thinking by that, and then a change in action, a change in words, all of these kinds of things. And none of this should be, none of this should be something that is frightening to us because we can't get to tomorrow by staying in yesterday. We can't get to the person that we want to be by clinging on to the person that we were. So there are changes. Changing in our words, changing in our actions, changing in the results that we will see come about. There are changes that will begin to take place within us. And so to release the old and to allow the new to begin to take place within us. And so we will begin to affirm the new. Behold, I make all things new. One of my favorite writers had this statement that was so profound, written so long ago. But the statement says, it is a natural law that thoughts and feelings get stronger as we speak them. Thoughts and feelings get stronger as we speak them. Thoughts and feelings get stronger. So the more a person says that or say that they are not feeling well, the worse they feel. They feel worse because they said they feel bad. But then she said, this writer said, 
that they can change how they feel by saying they feel better. So rather than say what you feel, say how you want to feel. The biblical statement is said, let the weak say they are strong. And that's called affirmations. Let the weak say, I am strong. And so you begin to speak that which you know you have prayed about and which is what you perceive, but what you've already received, I say in your imagination in the fourth dimension, you begin to say it aloud as the reality that you are already living in. Because the kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. And you're living in that kingdom. So you're talking kingdom language. And you begin to say it from the inside of you. And if you've got a community of people who are speaking that same language, it is an entirely different language than the rest of the world. It is an entirely different language. And you begin to speak that language, different language than the rest of the world, when you get together and see one another. One of the words that comes out of this kind of movement is the word namaste. And that word says, I see God within you. I see God within you. It is such a powerful statement because it is so much like God to see God within us. Remember the text says, God's eyes are too pure to see evil. God's eyes are too pure to see evil. Never saw evil. Jesus Christ never saw a person who was paralyzed, never saw a person who was sinner, never saw a person who was blind, never saw a person who was sick. And because he never saw a person who was in those conditions, he was able to heal them. He was able to heal them. And so how do you pray? You pray knowing that in the kingdom of God that is within you, that the answer is already Realize. Realize. Remember, time is relative. So once you're clear about the answer, already realized, you know that sooner or later, time is going to bring forth the manifestation. And you stay and you persist and you keep on praising God anyhow. Because ultimately, God's will will be done in heaven which is above in the mental state that you have, as it is on earth, which is this third dimensional level of living. That's what it means that imagination creates reality. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But for now, we'll give this motivational version of inspiration. Take care, bless you, and just... Think on these things for a moment, not just think, but practice it.
email at I will restore. Send it to info at I will restore. If you're able to get the the three items that we mentioned were done by Neville, we want to send them to you. The secret of prayer. If imagination creates reality, and imagining creates, because this is not really just simply a presentation; it's a training. It will change your life. Info, and I will restore. We'll talk. We'll train. We will change your very life as long as you stay with. Me. What we're talking about and practicing it. Blessings. Take care.